Yes, uh, good morning, everyone, and to, uh, to you, Liz, our Young Adult in Christian Ministries Coordinator in Mother AME Zion Church, to our most distinguished panelists who are with us on today. Uh, we are very grateful that you have opted to cast your Sunday, Saturday afternoons with us uh, for this very necessary and incredibly vital conversation concerning our need uh, to vote as, as a people. Hmm? I want to give some what? very brief context okay. uh, regarding who we are as a congregation. Uh, uh, Mother AME Zion Church is the Church of Black Liberation. Our origins go back as early as 1774 uh, with our early founding and we were organized as a separate religious institution in 1796. And the heartbeat of our con congregation has always been liberation for our people. We were always upfront uh, concerning abolition, concerning civil rights, uh, concerning uh, equal uh, access uh, for black women uh, within church leadership and with even in the marginalized culture in which they have lived. Uh, and even now, in this issue of voting, it goes back to black property owners here in New York City in Seneca Village, black male property owners in Seneca Village, and even before that. So our con congregation has always been involved in the vehicles that are necessary for the upward mobility of our people. And most certainly, voting is indeed one of those rights, one of those privileges uh, that we take very, very, very seriously in our con congregation. So this conversation uh, being led by our young adults is in every sense of the word, uh, a part of our spiritual and cultural DNA. We believe this is a spiritual act as well as a political and cultural act to make our voice known at the ballot box. This is a justice issue. So if you want to know where Jesus would be during times like this, Jesus would be encouraging persons to, to, to uh, make, their, make their presence known in the census. If you go back, registering in the census was a biblical principle. Before Jesus was born, his uh, parents, earthly parents, had to go and register. They had to make it very clear who they were, where they were from, how many people lived in the household. So when I hear people say things such as, I don't want to involve myself in the census, well, you are stepping away from something that even Jesus and his family had to do in their age. And for voting, it's also spiritual. Jesus associates himself with those who have been disinherited and marginalized. So it's not just for those who bled and died for us to have the right to vote. That is, that is also significant. But it's also significant that we value our own dignity, that we value our own personhood enough and think enough of ourselves and our children and our future to enlist ourselves in this necessary fight for human liberation and dignity that we can all take part in first by casting our vote. And we thank all of you uh, for joining us. And indeed, to our distinguished panelists, thank you for being with us. Okay, wonderful. Miss Denise, can you run it now or should I just do it without it? There we go. So, Miss Denise, pause the video for me. Just, uh, just pause it. 
Just hit the pause. Thank you. So uh, given that we are who we are and the Church of Black Liberation, we vote once again because we can. We vote because voting is our voice. We vote because it matters. Um, I want everybody to know that the most important part about voting is making it personal for you. What motivates you, what encourages you, what pushes you. So you have to find your why. Um, it's really, really important that you find your why. What matters to you, who matters to you, those issues that resonate most deeply for you, how you want to use your voice, and the when you use your voice is when you get to the ballot box. You can hit play. Um, included in this presentation that we will make available to you guys at the close of this is a link to a website called headcount.org. And in that link, it allows you to do everything. You can check your registration status, you can register to vote, and then you can go to a site, there's a, there's a separate link that allows you to go to something called My Ballot, myballotready.org. It's an, it's, a, it's an addendum to the Headcount website. What it allows you to do is it lets you put in your, your zip code and your last name and it pulls up the ballot for the area in which you live. And it tells you every single piece of everything that is on the ballot that you will be voting for on November 3rd. So I want you to go to headcount.org to register. I want, you, can you pause it, Ms. Denny? Thank you. Um, I want you to go to head, headcount.org to check your registration status first. So if you're registered to vote, but you may not have voted in the primary and you may not have voted in the previous election, if you go, you can check because sometimes in some southern states, they purge their rolls if you haven't voted in the last two immediately prior elections. So you want to check your status, you want to get registered, and then you want to see what's on your ballot so you know what you're voting for. Um, there are a lot of people who feel very, very strongly that, you know, their candidate didn't make it out of the primary process. And so they've decided that they're not going to vote in this election. Know this. When you do not cast a vote, that is a vote. Choosing not to use your voice is just as, it, it's just, it makes just as much of an impact as using your voice. So when you don't vote or you opt to sit out, it's just as detrimental as choosing, as choosing to, as, as, as it's just as detrimental, period, hard stop. It is a vote for more of the same. And I don't know about y'all, but I can't take more of this. I cannot take being confined to my house much longer. I can't take not being able to see my family much longer. Um, so if, if everything in this moment at this time is working exactly the way you want it to, then by all means, opt not to cast your vote. But I know that given some of the conversations that I've had with people who are participating, the panelists in this discussion, I know that we want to see change. And the only way you see change is to use your voice. Ms. Denise, you can go to the next slide. You have to cast your vote. You know, um, there's an old saying, you know, you can't, if you, if you don't do anything to participate, then you can't complain about the results that you get. So you have to be engaged, you have to show up, you have to participate. It's just that simple. Next slide. Hit the, hit the arrow button. Oh, did we, did we wait, wait? What happened here? Just hit the arrow button. This button's here. The last point that I want to make before I turn this over to um, my next panelist is, is simply this. An uninformed electorate is just as dangerous as a lazy electorate. 
we have to know who's on our ballot, both at all, at all levels, at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, because those positions at the local level are what fundamentally affects your everyday life. You have to understand the game. You have to know the rules, know the, know the requirements in your state. For instance, Danielle lives in North Carolina. North Carolina, with the exception of the governor, has no term limits on any of their elected officials. So once they get in office, they can, they can continue to run. Even if they run unopposed, they can automatically be reelected into that position because they're on the ballot and there's no contention and there's no term limit. So you can't even vote them out based on term limits. Know the rules for your state. That is so important. We have to know the rules. And let's be clear, there are our, our, there are our counterparts who depend on us being uninformed and remaining uninformed. We are going to post this um, when at the close of this, we're going to repost this on the Mother Zion web, YouTube webpage. And I will make sure that you guys have access to all of the hyperlinks that I've included in this presentation so that you can just click and go where you need to go. Like I said, you have to do your research. The only thing more dangerous than a lazy electorate is an uninformed one. Know, your, know who's on the can, know your candidates, know who's on the ballot, know what they stand for, and hold them accountable if there's something that you've elected them to do that they're not doing. You have, you have to know your candidates and hold your local candidates accountable. My mother is a big proponent of writing letters. Letters help. Put your thoughts in writing and send them to your local, to your local officials, your state officials, and make sure that they know. We have to vote in November like our life depends on it. Because to be perfectly honest with you, it really, really does. I am going to turn this over now to um, my girlfriend, Danielle Hogan Jackson, who is a recruiting professional. And she is going to talk about why it is important we vote from, a, from an employment standpoint. And how and how these how our decisions and our choices affect us in that in that arena. So by all means, Miss Danielle, please take it away. Okay, my name is Danielle Jackson. I, as she stated, I sit in Charlotte, North Carolina. I have been in recruiting and staffing and HR for, gosh, almost twenty years now. Um, if not all my life, because my mother was one. Um, where right now I currently work for Kelly Services as a recruiting team lead um, in the professional and industrial space. I have worked for Apple. I have worked for Bank of America. So when I speak to you, I'm speaking to you honestly from where government intersects with employment. And there are the fundamental things that government does they are in charge, the umbrella is protection. Um, through enforcement of, or creation of legislation and or in the position of creating agencies that enforce the legislation. Um, the reason why this is personal to me is because I think we lose sight of the election process and we only get in the game when it is at the federal level. And since this is football season, I'm going to go with the football analogy. And for me, the federal government election happens every four years. That's a Super Bowl. We have skipped all 16 games, the playoffs, and everything in between, the preseason, even the draft. We've skipped all of that and went straight to the Super Bowl and are ready to hold the federal government accountable. No, that's, it's too late. I mean, by then, decisions have been made about how you are, how employment is governed, how the laws are in position. We're still sitting around saying that the federal government needs to make minimum wage $15 an hour. Well, I can tell you, I'm from California. San Francisco has had $15 minimum wage for 10 years. That was the local level. Again, that's like 
the draft. We drafted a, a good um, governor, a good, I mean, not a governor, a good mayor, a good city council. Then they went straight into preseason. They drafted a piece of legislation. They went straight from preseason into the game and they drafted a legislation that went from 12, to, from regular minimum wage, which was 725 to 1250. From 1250, they also implemented a dollar search, a tax that would go into a pot before there was the Affordable Health Care Act, i.e. Obamacare. There was a pot for everyone who was an, a waitress, a gig worker, to um, have health insurance you would notice the surcharge on your bill. That was 10, 15, 10, almost 15 years ago. And now we're still waiting for the federal government. And in terms of employment, as an employer, you need to look at these elected officials as if they are your employees. You need to hold them accountable. And so if the government is there to protect you, which is what they're do what they're responsible for. You need to really engage in understanding exactly the specific levels of protection. Um, for example, I can give you in terms of right now. Liz was right. I'm ready to get out the house. I'm ready to go and see people and hug people, and I'm ready for everybody to go back to work full time in in the offices except for OSHA, which is the Office of Compliance for making sure that places are safe. It hasn't had any money or funding or teeth or enactment. We need OSHA right now. Now that is at the federal level. And you can't go into work and be safe, let alone hold your employer accountable for your safety. So there are legislation. So you really do need to make sure that you participate in every level. Um, for example, there's expungement clinics and you have to use that word. There are individuals who have paid their debt to society completely. And most states have indeed passed a law that says whatever the offense is, if it's within reason, it can even be manslaughter. If it was just whatever it was, you can get your record expunged, meaning that that person never has to mention it again. But if uh, they're not going to tell you that it's out there. And so there's so many levels of where the government intersects with employment that I deal with every day that um, I'm encouraging everyone to just, you've got to go and do the research. You've got to understand, and then you've got to hold them accountable for it. So if you're waiting for your minimum wage to go up, then your city council person, that's who is going to be the one that's going to impact you first. Your state legislation, if you want if you've had a family member that has been convicted of a felony, we all make mistakes, but you want them to, they're in a position where they want to get their life back, then you need to petition your legislation that I want expungement on the books. If it is, then I need, you need to establish, a, for example, my church here in Charlotte, as well as my mom's church in California, they have what they call expungement clinics where each step of the process is in one building and in one set, one Saturday, a person's record is completely wiped out. Then you need to start to, you know, my grandma who just recently passed away, she was, she was 104, she was like, you know what, well, we can put some, we can pray all day, baby girl, but we need to put some feet on these prayers. And so if we're going to put some feet on these prayers, then we need to get in the game and stop waiting for the Super Bowl and realize that we got drafts, we got preseason, we got 16 games, and then we got the playoffs. And then we have the Super Bowl, which is always the federal government. And we need to not wait for them anymore. And so I can go on and on about how the government interacts with employment. 
Um, I will leave myself as a resource. Um, I'm a recruiter by heart. So, you know, if you have somebody, and because I work for Kelly Services, which is a nationwide company, um, if there's, I'm always saying, if there's somebody who needs a job, I'm always in the process of recruiting somebody to go back to work because in this stage of the game, um, the deck is always stacked against brown and black people. And I used to be um, probably, my mother would say, the last idealist on earth. Well, reality has smacked me in the face one too many times and I am no longer willing to just put my finger on the scale. Danielle every day is putting her whole hand on the scale and saying, you know, catch me. I have no, uh, I'm unapologetic about um, evening out the playing field. Um, I'm not only a female, I'm not only an African American, I'm also a person with a disability. So if there's anybody who is an advocate for visibility, for change, for holding people accountable, it's me. And so I will definitely put my information in the Q&A section or the link. And if anybody has any questions, comments, and concerns, or just say, hey, you know, point me in the right direction, um, go sign up for, do anything, but you got to get in the game more than just voting. You have to, the reason why we vote is like Liz says, because we can. And if I could once again give an analogy, those of you who have children or who are children, which we all are, and you, your mama told you to do something, and you said, why? And she said, because I said so. Well, that's why we vote, because we, because the Constitution says so. But we need a reason to vote. And your reason to vote is because something means something to you. And that's, and from an employment perspective, I vote because I want to change the way we are protected by the government, both state, local, and federal. That's my story. I don't think there's any, nobody has a question for me. So. Not yet. Um, thank you so much, Danielle. Um, Roscoe, let's, let's, let's bring you into this conversation as a, as a Board of Elections employee and a member, a current voting member of the NAACP. <laughs> um, let's, let's, let's have you kind of give us your perspective. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for asking me to participate today. Uh, I am a voting member, uh, a delegate for the NAACP. So my apologies for the lateness and uh, for uh, this current moment, uh, the way I am participating. We're in the middle of our elections and uh, it is a much longer process than we anticipated today. Uh, with that said, I am also a newly appointed employee at the Board of Elections. For those of you who don't know, the Board of Elections is the official organization that is responsible for ensuring the integrity of our vote in the United States, as well as ensuring that this, these United States continues to exist because people believe in and trust in the voting system. Uh, there are boards of election in every city or town, every state, and across the country. And as a result, we are able to work together at the local level to validate all ballots, all registrations, all death certificates, and uh, name changes when it comes to marriage. The question is about why I vote. <clears throat> and given the range of activities that I participate in, including my work with the NAACP, uh, it becomes even more important for me to speak about the voting process and how this has been something over time African Americans have been disenfranchised from. Uh, you know, they say if there is something worth anything, then it's worth fighting for. 
And if it's worth fighting for, then it is something that others who wish for you not to have it will work to ensure you don't. And that has been the history of the vote in the United States as it relates to African Americans and our ability to secure the right to vote. We have historically been uh, kept away from the polls. There have been many efforts and there are eth efforts underway today to ensure that we don't vote. Uh, but on a more personal level, voting ensures that I have a say in what happens right here in my community. I believe we've already addressed that voting just doesn't mean uh, and happen on the presidential level or the federal level, but that it also affects our everyday lives. I don't think many people uh, really consider just how important a vote is for your elected officials. Uh, you know, our elected officials are responsible for, let's say, our judges. They're responsible for making decisions on black bodies. Our attorneys general, they are responsible for hopefully being nonpartisan and erring on the side of justice when it comes to crimes against individuals. Uh, in this case, we can see what has happened with Breonna Taylor and how these law enforcement officers have been allowed to get away yet again with murdering another black person. The voting process is designed to ensure that there is integrity in our elections and that those who vote actually have a say in what happens in our government. One of the little known facts about American history is that just after Reconstruction or during, during Reconstruction, just after slavery, we saw the highest percentage of African Americans being elected to office. And it was at such a high rate that it alarmed many of our white counterparts, not just in the South, but across the country. Because black folks having not only the right to vote, but exercising that right meant that we would become fully enfranchised members of society. And as a result, the things that we wish for in our lives would become manifest. So there are many reasons why I vote, but I think the biggest one, in addition to just the fact that people died for my right to vote and your right to vote, is that I have an opportunity to affect some young person's life by making a decision and casting my ballot, casting my vote for someone whom I believe will help move us forward as a society and will represent my principles and represent our freedom and operate in a way that preserves our democracy. Uh, I think that the conversation that has been happening so far about the intersection between uh, where the government is and where our public exists is an important one to consider. You know, as you think about, or as all of us think about what we do to vote or what we do, I encourage everyone to take a moment and register. If you're not registered, uh, you can go to vote.nyc as well to find out more information. And you can come into your uh, local uh, board of elections. If you're here in New York City, that would be downtown at my office at 200 Varick Street, where we stand ready to assist American citizens in the voting process. Uh, so I yield the floor back to you, Elizabeth. Uh, I will stand by in case there are other questions, uh, but I am also participating in a voting initiative that is happening right now with the NAACP as we march down Broadway here in, in Harlem. And so uh, I may need to transition there as well. Uh, Roscoe, you have a question before you go back to being muted. It is, what are some things in New York City is doing to protect the vote? Oh, well, there's an entire process uh, in terms of protecting the vote. One of the things that you can do that happens in New York City is expanding the voting registrar, registry. So the more people you have to vote, the better your outcomes are going to be. The more likely you're going to have a very broad margin or wide margin between those who vote 
uh, for one candidate and those who vote for another. So that's one thing, is actually participate. The other thing to ensure the integrity of our election are the processes that the Board of Election has in place. Uh, not only, I, I serve, me, I, serving as a Democrat, I've been paired with a Republican who work together and validate each other's work so that when we bring a ballot or you bring a registr registration, you have individuals from the two parties ensuring that that registration is honored and recognized and presented in the way that the, in the individual who voted intended for it to be represented. Uh, and the third thing that we do is we work within our organization uh, to expedite and streamline processes. So we're actually in a process improvement and quality assurance phase right now because we are preparing for such a significant election. Uh, we've seen more registrations than ever. And so people think that the vote only happens in the, uh, primar uh, the primary and then of course in your early voting and then on election day for the general election. However, those are the significant days, but there are actions that are taken all year long and we'll have work all into the evening, uh, all the way up into the election and through the election cycle. Uh, so it's not just one day, although you all are voting as citizens on one day or over a period of days during early voting, which is October 24th for nine days but it's also all of the other components that ensure that those ballots are scanned properly, that they, the information on the ballots is correct and accurate, and that you know, as the voter, where you can go for your polling locations. We still have not completed that part of the process yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question being asked that for um, the panel, but I'm actually, Bamike wants to answer this one, so I'm going to ask her to unmute herself. And the question is, we see in Virginia folks blocking voters from going to the polls. What do we do if that happens? I actually didn't mean to say as I answered that one. I was just trying to <laughs> open it up to the panelists. Um, I think it's, I think Roscoe, actually, you might be able to actually answer that question better than I would in regards to what we can do to be, uh, let me actually go back to that question. Which question is it? It says, we see in Virginia folks blocking voters from going to the polls. What do you do if that happens in your state? Well, one thing you can do is work with your board of elections. Uh, you know, we have poll workers and individuals who are responsible for watching the elections. Uh, our watchers cannot actually participate in any way, like get involved in the situation and diffuse it. But what they can do is notify the board. Uh, they can notify those who are responsible for the space in which the elections are taking place. And that can be corrected. Uh, so those are more immediate things that can happen. Uh, but really discouraging voters from voting has been a practice, as I said earlier, uh, that individuals in the United States have engaged in since African Americans uh, were granted the right or we won the right to vote. Did that answer your question? I think it did. I think it was a pretty good piece of advice. Um, yeah, I think that definitely answered. And there's another one that's actually in the chat from Chloe as well um, in regards to... Yeah, it says, what advice would you give to people that are discouraged to vote um, or think it's pointless or rigged due to the Electoral College? Oh, boy, this is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the Electoral College is actually uh, one of the most difficult things to explain because it existed, it was created at a time when it was necessary to get a good idea of what the electorate actually was going to do in terms of voting. Uh, and so what would happen is these bodies of electors would actually determine the outcomes of the election. 
they would do it because there were ponies going across the country carrying ballots to the United States Capitol so that those ballots could be validated. And of course, now we don't need that because we've got the internet and things happen at the speed of light. So while time has changed, what hasn't changed is our system. There's some concern about the Electoral College in terms of how it uh, seems to support the ideas and the privilege, uh, the ideas of the elite the, and, and the, the processes and, and, and approach of the elite. And that it also stands in the way of one vote being one actual uh, one person having one vote. It does. Uh, but the reason the Electoral College is still in place is because there have not been enough individuals who are engaged in the process and actually challenging the fact that we have an Electoral College. So the best way to actually put an end to the Electoral College is by voting. Uh, it is a much more complicated and complex process than I could really uh, kind of encapsulate in this moment, but that gives you hopefully some understanding of the breadth uh, of action that has to be taken in order for us to abolish the Electoral College. Roscoe, this is Danielle. I have a question um, only simply because I just got my poll working assignment because I signed up to do early voting. Here in Charlotte, the um, the Spectrum Center where the Charlotte Hornets is open. However, if they don't get the volume of poll workers needed to man that facility, they're going to close it down and not make it. Is New York or do you know of any other? I mean, how do is there an encouragement that we need more poll workers out there because? We now have the NBA totally backing the need for expanded facility access um, that now we have bigger spaces for social distancing that now we don't have the manpower because previously my mother used to be a poll worker, but she's 70 in her 70s and she's not going to work there anymore. So. Um, can you speak to that about the necessity for the need for poll workers? Sure. So we have uh, at the Board of Elections, uh, we have a process of actually hiring people to go work the polls and we train them. But in addition to that, uh, we need to ensure that we have extra folks because about 25% of people who sign up to become poll workers end up not showing up the day of the election. And so it's important for us to know that we have enough people uh, engaged in the process and ready at a moment's notice. So on the day of the election, they'll be sitting in a designated area and early in the morning, they might be called to go to the polls. Uh, we have coordinators that ensure that these folks get out there. And we have a large push uh, through literature and online to encourage people to become part of the poll worker community, so to speak, and engage in that way uh, as a duty uh, and, and as also as an experience, uh, because it is quite an experience to sit in front of folks who are eager to vote. Before we get to any more questions, I want to give a chance, I want to give Bamike an opportunity to speak from her perspective as a beauty professional and um, a freelance creative. I want to give her an opportunity to speak and then we will answer. There was a question about um, what the expungement process is. And I want, I want that question answered, but I also want to give Bamike a chance to kind of do her thing first and then we'll get to any additional questions anybody might have. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Bumike Abenrino, and I am a freelance beauty creative in New York City. Um, I mean, I travel everywhere, but I'm based in New York City. And um, my reason why I vote as a beauty creative, as officially as a gig worker who works in production, is really, I mean, my employment being protected and protecting my talent, protecting my actors. Um, I'm pretty sure every single person who's on, who's attending as well as a panelist enjoys their Netflix, their Hulu, 
any of their, their streaming services during COVID. Because if we're not working, we're streaming something, we're watching something, we're watching music videos. And what people forget why it's important to vote is because they, they really think that, okay, it's another politician, it doesn't really relate to me. Well, when you can't watch your show because it's canceled, because it couldn't start production, because there weren't safety measures put in place by the administration that's currently in office, that's an issue. Not just that affects me as being employed on set and be able to pay my rent, feed my family, but it also affects you to be able to enjoy and watch the show. And I think a lot of people need to see all those different aspects and those different, all the little things that we enjoy and how we lose them when certain people aren't um, really for pushing the arts, protecting the arts, protecting the things that we all enjoy in our free time. So for me, I, I'm a makeup artist by trade. I work um, doing magazines, I work doing film and TV. I've done things with Netflix, I've done things with Pat McGrath for Fashion Week. So I'm in all these different spaces. I've done corporate headshots. So I'm kind of all over the place. So I connect with different people in different professions. But at the end of the day, I'm a person who's gonna be standing in front of someone, especially during COVID with, and unfortunately if I'm doing your makeup, you can't wear a mask. And so I'm not protected. And if I have COVID and my mask is maybe not completely on, you may not be protected. So having you know, programs like OSHA that is part of the government and that gain funding is an extremely important aspect to make sure the people that you vote into office are actually doing that. Because it does, it protects all of us as a whole because I think a lot of people don't realize how many people are actually on set of every Marvel movie. That there's thousands of people on set, people who are making the shoes, making the costumes, doing all these different little details, people taping down cords, and then they go back onto the train with you. They go back to all these different spaces and making sure that the people that we vote into office are making sure that we're safe and that we're fo following protocols and that there's consequences for inaction, for not following the guidelines that have been put in place. And if guidelines aren't being put in place, then we're all in danger. So we wanna make sure that not only are we protected, but we're also, our, our income is protected. Because if our income's not protected, you're not gonna see any of your new shows. You're not gonna see any of the things that you enjoy. You're not gonna be able to really spend your quarantine watching all the new fun things that we want to. And this goes for every aspect of the industry. And so I, and my very first election was one of my most exciting moments because I finally, and as another tidbit about me, I'm a Nigerian American immigrant. So I'm first generation American. So I don't have the history that a lot of black Americans do in the United States. So my family came here, I was born here. And even as someone who, is first generation American is ex extremely important for me to be able to have an effect. Because at the end of the day, everything that happens in this country affects me as well. Especially when it comes to my family members who may want to come to the country or family members who are currently in the country, making sure that they're able to stay, may making sure that they're able to go to school and do what they need to do and not be unfortunately kicked out because they don't want to approve DACA or they don't wanna reinstate and keep pushing the progressive mindset that was America from the very beginning. And so that's really, I mean, I don't have a whole big spiel. I think it's really just re going back to what Liz said is relating what's important to you. What do you enjoy? What do you love that you want to make sure is always gonna be there and the people that you care about and really making sure that you vote so that you can maintain those things in your life. And that's really back to you, Liz. I have a whole, I want to have a whole crazy <laughs> spiel. And early no, voting, I... again, like Roscoe said, is extremely important. That's something I'm personally going to do. Because then for people who do have that fear about COVID, which I'm going to actually talk to, ask Roscoe a question about that as well. It also, it helps you be able to spread it out. So 
I didn't want to do absentee voting for this because I felt it was very important for me to be able to go to the machines, put it into and have my ballot read. And for those people who also have the same mindset, they want to make sure that their ballot will be counted. Go to those polls and be safe, wear your mask and look at all the other options that you have. So you don't have to go on the, the day of general election, you have early voting. So making sure that you're looking at all those opportunities so that you can feel as safe as you wanna be. Well, you know what? I want to add to what you just said that uh, voting absentee actually does change when your ballot is counted. Absentee ballots are counted after the election and many people don't, are not aware of that. That is different, however, than voting early, which is a ballot that is counted during the election. And so if you're ever asked or put into a situation where you need to make a decision about voting, uh, it is perhaps in your best interest if you want your ballot to be counted at the time the election is actually tabulated to wait until early voting and actually vote then. Uh, I believe there was another question that was in the queue and I've just had to change devices. So uh, the if question you in the queue has to do with uh, Madison Square Garden being an available voting site and the desire to find out if that's only open to people who live in that zip code or if it's open to all New Yorkers. So I, as I kind of hinted at earlier, um, we have not determined, or at least as far as we know, uh, on the front lines, we don't know exactly when or where, I should say, we don't know where we're going to have polling locations. Um, we're waiting to hear back and we'll have more information as that becomes available. But right now, I think the most important thing is that people know where they can go to vote early and that we should all plan our vote as well. Mm -hmm. uh, a venue as large as Madison Square Garden uh, would be great, and uh, it would help in the process for so many people, including with social distancing. Uh, but it is not the only option, and it is certainly one that, uh, you know, if we looked at schools, it's, they're certainly not the best option either. So, did it, that was, I believe, the gist of the question. Yeah. Um, okay. I so, saw another question come in as well. Hold on one second, because there was a question that came in um, while you were speaking for Danielle about the expungement process, and I want her to be able to answer that before we take the next question. Okay. That question has been on the floor for a little while. <clears throat> Z, we can't hear you. Donya, we can't hear you. Donya, we can't hear you. Donya, try to unmute and unmute again to see if that clears it up. No, she just dropped out. She was having a she was having a connectivity problem. Okay. Um, so there Rocco, was a question a question yeah, about um, if you decide to get a absentee ballot but decide to go into the polls instead, what would be, oh wait, did Ross, oh no, Ross, okay. No, oh, I can answer this question because I did that. Um, I got an absentee ballot for the primary and, just, and didn't have a chance to mail it in before election day. I called the board of elections and they told me to go to my normal polling place and go ahead and cast my vote and just throw out my absentee ballot because I hadn't put it in the mail yet. That is absolutely the correct answer. Uh, you know, <laughs> voting, voting absentee is only uh, a thing if you're actually going to do it. But if you fill out the form, you're totally fine if you actually don't go through the process. Okay, I'm back. I got, apparently I got kicked out. Can you hear me now? Oh, now Liz is low. Okay, and what I, I was really yielding the floor to Roscoe because I knew he had to go and um, I wanted to make sure that his, that his questions are far more important than uh, what I had to talk about. But in terms of um, one thing that I, keep, that I threw out there, which 
I wanted to make sure that I clarified. And um, that was mentioned before, OSHA. That is called, um, the true definition of OSHA is the, um, it's the Office of uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It's an administration that protects workers' rights. It helps with, you could file a complaint. It's just legally protecting you, just like she said. They're the ones that, and like I said before, they're the ones that are going to protect you from your employer if your employer chooses not to do right by your health and safety. In terms of expungement, expungement is a process that is um, a piece of legislation that was handled by your particular state. Um, I would simply type in, and you have to use the word expungement, not I want my record cleared or, and I will, um, and it's E-X-P-U-N-G-E-M-E-N-T-S. The process is different for each state. Um, you submit, um, you can go to your um, local state legislature. It would be under your secretary, um, your attorney general. Um, there are, to find out what qualify, what um, offenses qualify for expungement. Um, and then you can complete the forms to petition for expungement. Then um, it's in the state of North Carolina, expungement petitioners do not require an attorney. However, in California, it does require an attorney. Each state is different. Um, in absence of a legal per, a petitioner, um, must be complete. The forms must be completely filled out. Um, there are a myriad of forms, and then prior to completion, you have to go through the criminal background checks. There are five or six different levels of in California. In North Carolina, it's a little bit simpler, which is hard to believe. Um, but that's exactly how it works for North Carolina. Um, but it's so important because there is, it, it, you would be surprised how many people's records can be completely cleared. Um, the disappointing fact is that um, for example, the state of Florida doesn't even have the expungement process. However, they have put in legislation to have felons be reinstated to having their voting rights at um, re their voting ability reinstated only to have a poll a poll tax excuse me a poll tax. I'm gonna call it what it is. When you make somebody pay back their restitution that they've been out of the criminal justice system for 20 years and now you going back and pulling up oh your court fees from 25 years ago and then putting interest on top of it that's a poll tax i mean let's we uh you know i don't i call a lie a lie there's no alternative facts um mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we need to call it, we need to really start to call it what it is. And, um, and that's what expungement will do. Again, I will put my um, contact information. Um, I'll, I'll make myself available to, to Liz to, so that she can post it. Um, I help, I'm, I pretty much know a district attorney in almost, or an attorney general in almost every state, considering that as um, an employer, I have companies in multiple locations in multiple states. And like I said, right now my hand is all on the scale, just all weight is all in, all, all in. Did that answer? the expungement process. I did find out the expunge, uh, the link to the expungement process for the state of New York, which I do believe most everyone here is. I'm the only one south of the Oh no, uh, we've got people from PA and a couple of other states on here. We actually have a question for someone from PA and this one I believe is for Roscoe because I can't answer this question. No, I was gonna actually answer it. The one about- Okay, B, go ahead. The polling well, place so in PA. 
Yeah. So if, when it comes to polling places, I mean, Ross can definitely answer this as well, but it's really about going to your government, your state's website. So if it's something that's being posted on the voting website by your state, making sure that the web address is for your state and not some random website that's pretending to be, then it should be a trusted location to vote. That shouldn't be an issue. Now, if it's a, you know, .com, it should be a .gov or a dot, you know, .pa, then you know that you might have an issue if, with the credibility. Um, we had and another question. If, if Roscoe wants to add to that, if there's. Roscoe, do you want to add to that? I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> we have another question. Um, and this one is for you, Roscoe, in large part because you mentioned that schools are not an ideal polling, place, polling location. Um, and she happens to agree with you. Her polling place happens, her polling this year is a retirement center. And she is, or I guess it has been in the past. And she's thinking that it probably won't be her polling location this year. So she wants to know what happens in neighborhoods like hers in cases like this. And she is actually in Brooklyn. So this is a New York question. Roscoe, where'd you go? Where did he go? Um, if you want to double check your polling place and you live in New York City, if you go to NYC. If you go to votenyc.org and you type in your zip code, it'll give you both your early your early voting location as well as your day of voting location. And if you're not as comfortable with where you would typically vote and you would prefer to vote early just to get it out of the way and to make sure that you don't end up in a place that you're not comfortable, um, that would be the way to do it, to just double check. Roscoe, I could be wrong, but you can, you can clarify. All right, so I'm okay, Roscoe, you just need to go. Walking, uh, was about to walk uh, to early and your polling location. Can you go? Thank you very much. Uh, but I, I, I wish you all well <laughs> this afternoon as I am caught between a rock and a hard place. God bless you. Do, what, um, is there something I can answer right now? Yes. The answer, I just wanted to make sure that I gave the correct directive. There was a question about the fact that someone's polling place in Brooklyn is a retirement center. And the question is, is she assuming that that probably won't be her polling location this year for obvious reasons? And she wanted to know what happens in neighborhoods like hers in cases like this. But I imagine that the Board of Elections, if you go to vote.myc.gov, I believe, if you the .gov or and, .org, it should uh, give you your polling place if you type in your zip or correct. whatever the new one is. That's what I was saying. You're right. That's absolutely right. Vote.nyc is the link and the website. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Roscoe, thank go you. walk. Thank you so yes, much you so for, much. for right. being with us for as long as you have been. We know you have to go. We thank you so much for your participation. Um, feel free to ask any more questions um, for those people participating, either via Facebook Live. Uh, we have people who are working in the Facebook Live chat to get your questions to us in the Zoom. So we are answering in real time. Um, and also, if you want to just type your question in the Zoom chat bar, for those of you who are still on with us, uh, we're happy to have you. And you can just put your, you can put your question in the chat and we will answer them as we get them. Um, if we have answered all of the questions though, and there's not anything else that anyone else wants to discuss, we will, we will get ready to conclude our webinar. Um, if we don't have any more questions, and I'm double checking to make sure that we, oh no, we did have one more question. Uh, where was it? <laughs> and actually try put your questions in the um, Q&A box so that we're able to see them. Um, yes. More consistently, because then we'll be able to answer them and address them easier. 
Oh, and there's another thing. Um, someone made a comment, not so much a question. The New York Times web, the New York Times newspaper and their website has a huge section on how to vote. I added the link for the New York Times interactive how to vote um, information inside the chat box. If you click on that link, it will take you directly to the New York Times website and their how to vote apparatus. It's a whole interactive process that you can click through. So for people who live in states other than New York, feel free to use that link, click in and get whatever answers you need. The other question that we had is what are your thoughts about the Southern strategy, Southern strategy being in all quotes, and why the majority of Black, Amer Black Americans are members of a particular party? You want me to handle that, Leah? Yes, ma'am. Since I am indeed south of the Mason-Dixon line, and even though my accent clearly doesn't delineate that I am from California originally, um, the Southern strategy is, um, is historic. It is, and it is proven to be the most effective strategy ever. And here's why because we are, we don't get in the game. I mean, we just, the, the mindset that there is the man that's holding us back is real. Um, and that is the unfortunate thing that is, so the Southern strategy, it works. We have, um, we choose not to get in the game. Like I said, we choose not to participate in the draft process, the preseason games, or any of the 16 games that happen before the Super Bowl or the playoffs. And um, one of the things that um, makes it effective is that we don't, yell and scream about polling places closing until the federal election. But there were elections, I can list three between in the last, between in every two years, there is, we elect our um, local government agencies. Some of the state positions are up there. Um, and certainly our Congress people are up there. And nobody even pays attention to the fact that their polling place closed or they didn't. So the Southern strategy is just effective because we sit out. And maybe it was vote, the consistency of voter intimidation starting in the South that those of you who are north of the Mason-Dixon line tend to just freely say, yeah, I'm going because my polling place is always open. And But I've noticed, I mean, I've seen my polling place close. I've seen the reduction of the legislators closing down how long early voting is, closing down the number of, of polling locations that are open. Um, that's effective at a legislative, at a state legislation level. So once again, we only get in the game and then we find out, oh, wait a minute, my name's been purged from the roll. Didn't know that, didn't check it until I went to go vote the day of. My polling location, which I've, since I haven't voted, I went to the one closest to me because it had the sign that said, vote here and or and so it's just effective. There, there is no real reason why the Southern strategy, there's no formula to it, except for we don't do it. We don't part, black and brown people just don't participate. There are more black and brown people in Alabama and Mississippi and poor white people that would literally change and affect how the governing of that, those two particular states would swing in a whole nother direction. 
however they just don't go to vote but and that and so that's just really that's the basic that that's the end i mean there that's if there is no there's no rhyme or reason before liz before you go on i did want to correct something and i'm going to put okay. it in the chat box about expungement i pulled up the wrong thing in the state of new york there is no such thing as expungement which is interesting <laughs> there's called a sealed record yeah you can get your records in new york you, you get them sealed if i'm not mistaken get them sealed however reading further into the document you can find out that your record can be unsealed mm -hmm. <laughs> the case may be that you are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Ooh, in the, to know. In the wrong, so if you came to North Carolina and were in the wrong place at the wrong time and then you go to, and they go, they can unseal your record in New York, which is, slightly on the weird side that North Carolina will erase your record, but in New York, you'll, you'll just zip it up in a nice little Ziploc bag and take the air out and it can be reinflated. Basically. Um, but, and there was an employment thing that I just really wanted to make clear for everyone, because I don't know about the state of New York, but marijuana is not legalized by the federal government. Mm. Mm. We're gonna go on vacation to Colorado, to California, or any other state where recreational marijuana is a legal substance and have fun and come back and want to get a job in a state where recreational it, use is right. not legal. <laughs> recreational use and even medicinal use is not legal. Pennsylvania has made moves to make it okay if you have a medicinal marijuana card that if you test positive for me, I can still hire you. But don't 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 bring that don't don't bring don't 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 bring it here. I mean in most states in the union if the employer goes by the federal guidelines. Again, it is not a legal substance by the federal government. Feel free to have fun at your own risk. That's all that I, but see, you can petition your local legislation to make that change. If you make if the, if the state makes the change, then it can affect how an employer looks at it and if we get a new attorney general that person can also like eric holder i mean that would that's a cash only business he did make it okay for banks to accept that large amount of money from any legal substance by the federal government again here's how the federal government is directly impacting your life I want everybody want to have some fun. I mean, the peace, it's the peace pipe. I mean, even the Native Americans. I'm just saying. Just trying to be as officially real as I can. I mean, it's important because people don't think about that. It's like if you want to partake, your legislation needs to be in place so that you can legally partake with no consequence. Well, a lot of people don't realize this, even though recreational, um, recreational use of marijuana is allowed in the state of New York, there are a lot of organizations um, like federal, like especially banks, financial services, they drug test you. Yeah. So if you pop positive with, with marijuana in your system during the drug test, they can exercise their right not to hire you based on the fact that you like to use whatever for recreational purposes. They can choose to do that as a private institution. 
So just be mindful of that for those of you, because I know we might have a few folk on here who, you know, might like to light up every once and again. So just, just, just know the rules and know your industry too, as well. But Liz, this isn't, I, I'm hoping to encourage all the participants who are listening to take this information, whatever sparked your curiosity, and pass it forward because we can only be as effective as we involve our circle of influence. And Absolutely. our circle of influence is just the 25 people that are listening right now. Mm -hmm. if, we, if it just stays within this group, that's not effective. However, if I pass this video on to 25 other people that I know that didn't watch. Absolutely. then we've just multiplied our conversation. Absolutely. And that's what... Yeah. I mean, that's what white people do all the time. They do, they, they they play the game. Look, they know how to play learn. the game, and they, they learn play better. Yes, we, yes, they do. We have um we we're down to our last five minutes of the webinar, and for those people who have joined by phone and have a question, we're going to give you sixty seconds to ask it. We're we're online for another five to six minutes. So, uh, Mama Amelia, I'm going to go ahead and let you ask your question. So please feel free to ask it quickly. You have to unmute yourself, Grandma. I just raised my hand <laughs> yeah. uh, to say hello. Hi. I don't, you know, um, okay, I'm, I'm enjoying the conversation here and I think it's, it's so important that we do, that you do this again, Elizabeth, okay? Yeah. And to broaden the, the uh, audience. Uh, because so many things have come out, but especially the voting issue. Uh, just to say, I just want to comment on our Black people's, um, I don't, I, can we say lackadaisical? I don't know, but it's something wrong with us, okay? And as the person said, people died. There are people who died for our right to vote. And for no other reason, we should be knocking the doors down uh, at this time to make sure our votes are counted and that we vote. I had a young man to tell me he didn't believe in politics and he wasn't voting because he didn't like the candidates. And so I had a conversation with him. And when I finished, he said, okay, I'm going to vote. So <laughs> we have to do this. It's very important that we uh, do speak to uh, our young people, especially because they're the ones who are going to well, after me, they're going to be, when I'm gone, they'll still be going forward. So please continue this. And if you can do this again before November. 4th. We will do our best to do this, to do this at least once more before um, the general election on November 3rd. I just yeah. want to bring up two points that I did not, I don't know if I spoke to specifically. So let me address that now. Understand this for every single person who is watching Completing the census is important. If you live in a house with four or five people and you don't complete the census, that's like $28,000 you've literally just thrown away. The way that your, your neighborhood and your community gets financial resources from the government is by completing that census. It used to take in 20, I remember when I completed the census in 2010, it took me 45 minutes to fill out that whole form. Now it is a web-based form. It takes 10 minutes. 10 minutes gets you $7,000 per person in your household, in your community. That's a lot of money to leave on the table. And one thing I would hope is that as people of color, y'all know we love, a, we love a good sale and we love free money. So can we not leave free money on the table that's earmarked for us and our in our communities. I just think that that's super, super important. The other thing, and I know that I mentioned it when we started, um, I understand if your candidate isn't on the ballot, but as grownups, um, oh, I'm one, of, one, of, one of the people let me know that we have five more days to complete the census. So please, if you have not already complete your census, 
It takes 10 minutes. It's a web-based, it's a web-based form. Um, if someone can put that link for the census in the chat, I would greatly appreciate it um, so that people can go on and complete it. Here's the other thing that I wanted to say before, before, we, before we walk away from today. I understand if you are frustrated or angry if the candidate that you supported in the primary is not on the ballot. I understand that that's frustrating. I understand that that angers you. But here's the thing. A non-vote is a vote for, ex for, for whatever the status quo is right now. If you are comfortable with four more years or six more years or eight more years or 14 more years of more of the same, don't participate. If you want to see change, if you understand, if you are angry about what is going on with Breonna Taylor, if you are angry about the things that happened to George Floyd, if you have a pre-existing condition and you are worried about your health care, let me be clear about this. You cannot sit on the sidelines. You just cannot. And know this, as adults, and I know this is hard, but as adults, sometimes we have to make incredibly difficult decisions. And that means choosing between the devil you know, the devil you don't, and the devil you don't even want to see. That, that's just reality. Sometimes we have to make those kinds of choices. And if you know that you have to make these choices, even if you don't want to make them, you know, when people say, I'm grown, I can do what I want to do, I'm an adult, well, that's part of being grown and that's part of being an adult is making difficult decisions. And you're not always going to be able to choose between the candidate you really want and the candidate you don't. Sometimes you have to choose between the devil you know and the devil you don't. That's just, that's, that's our reality. But Liz, the, the, the reality is there's always the you, the person who's not going to be on the ballot that you wanted. You can only pick between one or two. Great. I mean, I mean we, we do this. So would you rather that I made the decision about your life? No, I would rather be able to participate in making a decision about my own life, which is why you can't choose to sit out and not vote. It's like you said, why do we vote? In really, really simple terms, you know, it's like when your mama says, when your mama tells you clean up your room and you say, but why? And mommy says, because I said so. Sometimes because I said so is the right answer. We don't, we don't like because I said so. We don't want to hear because I said so. But it matters. It really does matter. And so we have to, we have to, become, an, we have to become an engaged electorate. We are, oh, good Lord. Um, we are here and we, we, we outnumber a lot of our Caucasian counterparts, like two to one right now, or we're very, very close to that two to one. That means that from a numbers perspective, we are not the minority, we are the majority as black and brown people. So we need to use our voices as part of the majority to stand up and start taking back some of our power. You know, the Supreme, I remember the first presidential election I voted in was Bush, v, was um, Al Gore and George Bush II in 2000. Let, let me connect the dots for you and, and give you what, what nine degrees, you know, that six degrees of separation. The Supreme Court decided that Bush would become president. Rehnquist retired. He was the chief justice. George Bush appointed John Roberts. John Roberts made a decision a few years ago that took the teeth out of the Voting Rights Act because he said if the country can elect a black president, we're no longer, we're no longer as racially divided as we once were. Look at what happened in the 2016 election with all of those states having what was a voter ID, voter ID rules. They were purging the roles of black and brown people. And so both in the 2016 election and in the 2018 midterm elections, there were people who couldn't vote because they were either, they, they couldn't get to their polling place, they were black, their names were purged from the roles, a whole host of things. But look at, but look at how these things are connected. You know, with, with the death of RBG, Roe v. Wade is on the ballot. And not from a standpoint of, oh, you know, it's a woman's right to have an abortion. No, it's a woman's right to govern what happens to her own body, period, hard stop. No one else should be able to make those decisions because 
those people who are pro-life who believe, oh, well, you know, life happens at the moment of inception. What is the federal government doing to help you take care of this child that they've mandated you bring into this world? because they're doing their best to roll back as many federal, federal assistance programs as they can. They're trying to get rid of CHIP, which is, which is the Child Health Insurance Protection Act. All of these things matter, both for you, both for you as a woman, or a, you, know, you as a woman, you as a, as a minority, black, brown, Indian, Asian, because let's be clear, if you are not like a wasp, you are considered a minority in this country, even though you and might look white. I understand that not only is that being taken off the table, but the education to prevent those pregnancies is also been pulled from schools. So you're seeing a lot of that education that's pre preventative also being removed. All those different, you know, programs that are being, that we typically grew up with, um, mm -hmm. previous generations had, educating on different abstinence, different things to prevent, even birth control are being pulled. Planned Parenthood's being pulled because it's being seen as just an abortion clinic when that's not what it does. Majority of it was what it does. So okay. when you don't vote, those are removed. Those opportunities to con further yourself, to prevent things from happening that you would rather not have happened are removed from the equation. Okay. I, I, and as much, ladies, as, as much as I love the good debate about Roe v. Wade, <laughs> Let me just say this. Right now, we are living in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have, I personally, I was born before I was diagnosed with being black and a woman with a pre existing condition. Absolutely. Before we can even have a discussion about the rollback of Roe v. Wade, the new Supreme Court justice, which he's about to make this grand announcement in another four hours, <laughs> is a proponent to remove the Affordable Health Care Act. And the number one thing it protected by condition was pre-existing condition. Now, we got six point five million people that have been diagnosed with COVID. Which will be and that we already see signs of long term effects of COVID. Yep. Okay. And I'm gonna just mm -hmm. be honest, those people who wear glasses, boo, welcome to having a pre existing condition. Oh, you know they want to turn pregnancy into a pre existing condition. Exact well it <laughs> well a pre that is uh, so I'm gonna skip over Roe v. Wade and make it important for you to understand that we got, we've got a lot of bigger things on the table. Those of, you Absolutely. With, those of you with children, there are three Supreme Court justices that are within the last four years who are under the debate that Brown versus Board of Education is not, a, it's, it's not settled. Law. law so i mean you know forget the forget that i mean they're the republicans motto is you hatch them we fry them but that's neither here nor there um the problem that i have is that so many more pieces of legislation that are going to come before the supreme court are bigger than roe v wade Way Agreed. bigger than Agreed. Roe. Agreed. Agreed. Because we're talking Agreed. about basic ability to live so and I to get your <laughs> insulin. You cannot be the um, you cannot be pro-choice and pro-life. No, you cannot be pro-life and then kill me after I'm born. Come on. With the pre-existing hmm. condition, not cover, mm -hmm. cover me with pre-existing conditions not making it equitable for me to have fair labor standards, not mm -hmm. making it fair for me to have an, an equitable wage, not make it fair for me to have proper housing yeah. that's affordable. Mm -hmm. So at this point now, I don't really give a care about Roe v. Wade. I do. 
that's not I mean it, it I know it's another it's a it's additional it's, issue it's on a, top it's of an additional issue on top of it there's so many different layers it should be um, your thought but I know you need to close out Liz so yes I do we're closing out as we speak right now um, we, we thank you all for your attendance. We thank you all for your support. Um, my goal is to do this one more time before November 3rd because everybody has been, there's been such a, such a positive response oh, wait, before, to this discussion. Go ahead. I, there was a comment about, I for, completely forgot to address this. I wonder what it would take to get a third party candidate with a major election. Honestly, creating a third party. I mean, voting in to establish that and this is why voting is important and let's sorry for the interruption because i, rem no, I remember fine. that was in there no 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 no. that's fine that's fine ladies thank you so much um we thank uh roscoe who had to hop we thank uh reverend bird who also had to hop we thank miss denise for being our queen of all things technical um, we thank you for, we thank all of the people who have been watching on Facebook and thought it not robbery to share with their connections. Um, we thank you all for your time. We thank you all for your participation. Uh, we hope to see you again soon and be blessed. And remember, please, please complete your census and register to vote because our lives, the way that we have lived our lives up until this point, really, truly, honestly depends on it. I thank you for your I, I thank you for you for, for your for your attendance. Have a wonderful day and be blessed. Bye bye.